and at that time people used to always think that pediatric endocrinology is one branch which is basically very very rare dealing with rare complicated disorders which require cumbersome evaluation and expensive treatment this was a common thing everybody used to say what will pediatric endocrinology do nothing much to be done at this year but when we started seeing patients we were shocked by the way they were being managed and this is one case with dr rashmi and both of us managed it was a very short child diagnosed in 10 years with severe anemia presented for the first time and then at that point of time there was a short stature and was given a blood transfusion diagnosed as a case of celiac disease but unfortunately had developed hiv because of the blood transfusion which happened in that scenario so this was the unfortunate scenario a case which should have been diagnosed at the right time and should have been managed in that perspective always in that scenario so we thought what are the problem is it a problem of awareness accessibility or affordability now everybody says it is always a problem of cost so people say cost is a major problem but what is the truth is actually the elephant of the house is awareness if you don't know when should you go where should you go how you should be managed it is difficult once you go direction is there people will help you people will help the patient patient will help themselves but most important is awareness so from there we started our program and 2012 we had the first ppec and lot of people here including all the seniors dr subrato dr rishi everybody was part of that program and since then we have conducted huge number of programs across the region in the country but unfortunately how many physical programs one can do that is a limit to that so we started the advanced programs as well so we move forward from there to internet media because now internet is available so we started on youtube around 7 years ago and from there we move forward towards a structured program both on site as well as online and now we have got the application and other things which are happening we have e learning program which has got huge number of subscribers and all of you would have access that this would be something to go forward but problem with uh, youtube is that you can see one video and then you forget about it so if you want to have a systematic learning we started off with this program of medi classes 4 years ago in which we now have a fellowship program and a diploma program a lot of programs are there a lot of people are part of that program as well now we also run regular post graduate fellow classes and the publications and applications are there applications are going to make very easy day to day management in that regards the often problem still remains is that the number of pediatric endocrinologists in the country may be around 100 and 100 may be a over rating exaggeration cases are thousands so what do we need to do there needs to be a bridge between cases pediatricians and pediatricians with special interest and then more pediatric endocrinologists this is what we are looking at for that now we are trying to come up with a solution which hopefully will come up in the next 2 to 3 months which will help you out using a personalized intelligent emr so what it will do is that based upon your particular problem so if a child has short stature once you say short stature specific questions will come with regards to history examination this will be there for all conditions so precocious puberty delayed puberty dsd whatever 40 conditions we are developing these protocols you just have to enter this data once you enter you will ask specific questions on examination so for a delayed puberty it will ask anosmia for precocious puberty it will ask about headache so different questions will come once you answer those questions put basic data while you are examining the patient this is looking very benign simple you are just putting but what is and you may simultaneously assess bone age there so it looks very simple you are doing that but what is happening is that behind the scene algorithms are running which are then telling you this is the diagnosis this is the investigations required this is the likely treatment and then you will get a lot of output and you can then export it in the form of a proper it will give you like a proper history has been taken you will get results interpretation this is a work in progress lot of intelligent algorithms required it will take time but this is the way forward so this will allow everywhere across the country to have a state of the art quality assured sort of a management and then there could be connections with clinics as well so this is something which we are working in that direction last three days we had very intense program in the regency center for diabetes and technology and research over 30 people from across the country had come and it was a very good interaction with over 300 cases in which a lot of interactive discussion so very uh, good afternoon to one and all uh, is the teachers seniors and my colleagues let me thank anurag sir for uh, this wonderful opportunity here 
though it's a simple straight forward case i think uh, maybe one of them which may which we may all see in our uh, speed endo uh, career so but still i uh, i would like to present this just to emphasize the importance of clinical examination as we all know we start with poor history and clinical examination half work is done and um, so uh, moving on to the case we have a girl with carpocleidal spasm miss c she presented to us at 4 years of age she presented with spasm of hands and feet since 3 days which were actually painful spasms no history of seizures or hyperventilation no history of vomiting and headache or dragging gait no bony deformity or fractures no steatorrhea gi symptoms polyuria or weight loss she was admitted at outside hospital for a similar thing and was given iv medication was referred here past history Uh, there was a significant history of excessive weight gain noticed by mother she had taken to the doctor to the doctor at 11 months of age along with which mild developmental delay was also noticed and she was detected to have hypothyroidism uh, the, uh, we got the only a tsh value of 18.4 there was no free t4 value in this tsh 18.4 for which she was started on ethoxin at 50 microgram uh, daily She was regularly followed up after that for one year. It's continued on uh, entrosin and anterior natal postnatal history. She was term, uh, born as a full term normal delivery. It's birth weight of two point eight kg. There was a history of hypoglycemic seizure on day two of life. Uh, there was history of respiratory distress for which she was ventilated and was uh, some sort of sepsis kind of thing for which she was on antibiotics and was discharged home after two weeks. For after which she was feeling well. Developmental history, as I mentioned, there was a gross motor delay noticed. Other milestones of development were normal. And family history, uh, she was born as a um, second child with third degree consanguineous parents. And first child was nine years, male normal child. And second was uh, was IUD actually at eight months, male baby. A father sister had hypothyroidism. Uh, regarding history of uh, uh, There was no history of any short stature or any other endocrine problems in the mother. No. General physical examination. Here actually, physical examination was important. Uh, ch the child had a stocky build. The head size was normal. Face was rounded with no obvious dysmorphism. Deep she had dental caries, but no oral candida is noticed. Extremities she had short hands and feet, short stubby fingers, brachydactyly. And left knee, there was actually a hyperpigmented rough plaque with wrinkled surface. Now, sir, on the right hand, the site of IV cannulation probably calcium was given through that. Chosis and Rossio signs were negative in the normal, and she had a normal external genitalia. Coming to anatomical measurements, uh, her height was less than third third centile. She was uh, short for the age, and weight was around between ten to twenty fifth centile. With a BMI of sixteen point five, that point. Examination of system was apparently normal. So, so to uh, summarize, we have a four-year-old girl here, born of third degree consanguineous marriage, with hypothyroidism noticed at eleven months, with excessive weight gain there, uh, and now at four years presented with carpocleidal spasm. On examination, she had a stocky build, as in, but as we mentioned, with some amount of subcutaneous calcification also, with systems normal. So a probable diagnosis at this point would be uh, from uh, from the uh, system examination and the uh, general examination could be an HO phenotype uh, with spasms due to hypocalcemia. It would it would be a uh, picture of pseudo hypoparathyroidism as we all know. <coughs> Coming to the lab investigation, uh, I'll just um, read up the highlight abnormal values. Calcium was low, five point eight. Iron calcium is two point five nine, and phosphorus was nine point three. Serum magnesium was normal, and ALP was one forty one. Renal function, creatinine was normal. Uh, electrolytes were normal, and blood gas was uh, finally normal, no much acidosis. Vitamin D level was twenty five point seven, and in fact, PTH was four hundred and eighty four. It was high. Coming to uh, urine calcium creatinine ratio was actually normal. There was no probably uh, hypercalciuria. TSH three point four eight and three T four was one point two three. 
just uh, did an X-ray of the part with calcification, which proved our that roots of subcutaneous calcification. Now, the abdomen was normal. So, looking at the here, we have a child with hypocalcemia. So, uh, it's, it's basic of basis of uh, basic of approach to hypocalcemia, as we know. The next step we look at the serum phosphorus. When serum phosphorus is high, first thing to roll out is renal, uh, renal function. Look at look at the renal function test. When it's deranged, it's renal failure. Here we have a normal creatinine, so we move on to PTH, where uh, the, uh, we move on to the impaired PTH group, where the PTH production is actually there. PTH was high, and we had an, uh, we could conclude to a diagnosis of pseudo hypothyroidism. So this child we have a diagnosis of pseudo hypothyroidism. One A because we all know that this child has HO phenotype. With probable TSH resistance, which was manifested at 11, 11 months. So, as Sir yesterday said, any child with obesity and increased TSH in the first one year of life always think of TSH resistance as well as of which THT is one of the well, significant causes. So, uh, apart from TSH, we all know that THT 1A is because of GNAs, <coughs> alpha subunit of G stimulatory protein mutation, where other hormones like Thyrothormone, TSH, then uh, GNRH, and calcitonin acts. So treatment part is simple. Just to just to conclude what we did for the child, we have given uh, given her IV uh, calcium gluconate infusion of 8 ml per kg uh, with daily maintenance of vitamin D and calcium trial was started. There was a 50 percent of uh, reduction of the dose on by day two, 33 percent to day three, and slowly by day eight. Her calcium and phosphorus profile were better. She was discharged on day 10 with oral calcium of 2 gram, gram per day, vitamin D and calcium trial. And our final diagnosis was THP 1A, while a genetic analysis was not feasible in our hospital. Follow up the first follow up she came, she was doing well, no current or spasms noted. And her serum calcium was 9.2, it was pretty good with a phosphorus of 6. Uh, and she's continued on supplements. Thank you so much. I will take questions. Okay, that's me. So it was a wonderful presentation. I think the key message was that if you have a calcium, the most important is phosphorus. If your phosphorus is high, think of a PTH cost. But yesterday we discussed that if you have persistent vitamin D deficiency, you may have secondary PTH resistance. So that will also happen. So your vitamin D was normal because of very good point which excluded that. Third message was infantile obesity, do a TSH and PTH. If TSH is high, PTH is high, this is PHP. You will not have hypocalcemia in the first year, but you will have subclinical hypothyroidism that will be due to that. Uh, comments from Dada and the panelists. I think it was an excellent case. Uh, just remind me, what was the phenotype like? What all did you see in that? Uh, it was a, a kind of typical age of phenotype. She had round face, stocky build, she was short. She wanted to just present that. Sure. That is another take home message that it's a spotter when you have short stature yes. and they have this, you know, brachymetacardia. Ah, this uh, this child didn't have a brachymetacardia. Yes, and then she, there was a calcification there. Yes, that yes. is a a calcification in the thigh was there, which was wonderfully picked up on the x ray also. Yes. I think you can show the x ray also. So, if you see the x ray, you will find this nice subcutaneous calcification, which is there. So, this was a classical one, but again, important that phosphorus is the most important investigation in calcium disorders. That's what the big message. And the other thing, just what I mentioned in the first case, is that uh, whenever we see, first of all, I'm sure nobody in this room will just look at it. Because they're going to be opposed. They will do calcium and phosphorus and as well you want to So this is a given. And then next level PTH and whatnot. But this uh, constellation of hypocalcemia and uh, hyperphosphatemia, you can see in renal patients. So always check the creatinine in these patients. Just like when you have hyponatremia uh, and hyperkalemia, much commoner is renal failure. So don't miss that. So that is not, anyway, you have done that. Yes, but yes. Just emphasize that.